This is Many Voices, One World. I'm your host, George Papianis. Sometimes the simplest of statements say it all. We know more about the surface of the moon than we do about the surface of the deep ocean, the seabed. It's simple and surprising to find out what we know and what we don't know and why it matters. I am pleased to welcome Michael Lodge, Secretary General of the International Seabed Authority, to Many Voices, One World, and the second in our series, One Planet, One Ocean. Michael Lodge, welcome to Many Voices, One World. Thank you very much, George. Pleasure to be here. So I would venture to guess that not many people uh, know what the International a seabed authority is up to on a day-to-day basis. Perhaps you can give us an idea of what it is that you do. Well, I think that's true. Uh, probably not many people think about uh, the International Seabed Authority in uh, their day-to-day life, but we've actually been around for quite a long time. Uh, this year, in fact, we're celebrating our 25th anniversary. Uh, but our history goes back even further than that, and to really understand What the International Seabed Authority is all about, uh, we actually need to go back to the 1970s when the world was uh, negotiating what was going to be a new convention for the law of the sea, which uh, we now refer to as our constitution for the oceans. And a great part of the uh, discussion at that time was uh, about uh, the limits of national jurisdiction how much uh, countries would uh, get in terms of ocean space, 200-mile exclusive economic zone, uh, the continental shelf, which can go beyond 200 miles in some cases, uh, which uh, sounds like a lot, but uh, in fact that leaves about 54% of the seafloor of the ocean uh, that isn't owned by any state. And the question at the time was what to do with this area. Uh, The uh, industrialized countries at that time, the developed countries, uh, wanted to leave that area open for anyone to access if they had the money or the technology. When you say access, you mean to to, to explore? To explore and to exploit the resources, yeah. Uh, And the developing countries, on the other hand, were very concerned that uh, they didn't want this to be a free-for-all for for, uh, just the rich and powerful countries to to, uh, help themselves. Uh, And so they wanted some kind of uh, international management. And uh, in the end, uh, that's what the International Seabed Authority is. We were created in order to manage this space beyond national jurisdiction and to ensure that it is managed in a way that is sustainable for the benefit of all mankind. We have this uh, very important uh, concept uh, called the uh, common heritage where all the mineral resources on the seafloor are regarded as the common heritage of all mankind uh, that can only be utilized for the benefit of mankind as a whole. We used mankind back in the 1970s. I I keep using it because it's in the convention, but uh, uh, we we mean humankind these days. Um, And uh, that's really the concept. Uh, We exist in order to regulate access to this area. So it cannot be a free-for-all. It cannot be first come, first served, help yourself. Anybody, any state or company that wants to access these resources has to come through the International Seabed Authority. Uh, We will permit them, we may permit them to uh, access the resources, uh, providing it's done in a way that uh, is is regulated by us and that uh, uh, respects the marine environment, which is... uh, The most important part of our function is to ensure that uh, we protect and preserve the marine environment at the same time as uh, sustainably using the resources. Now, not only potentially was the nomenclature of how we refer to humankind or mankind uh, not uh, necessarily uh, established back in the 1970s, but nor, I guess, was our understanding of what was there in terms of the seabed. So we are talking now about uh, roughly, what do you say, 54% of, of the ocean. We're talking about, I mean, does, does offshore drilling come under your jurisdiction? Uh, for example, what you can see off the Louisiana coast. 
Or is it, are we talking, <clears throat> when we say deep, how deep is deep for yeah, you? We're, we're dealing with the deepest parts of the ocean. So, uh, no, offshore drilling wouldn't come under us. Uh, we only deal with the areas that are beyond national jurisdiction. So beyond 200 miles, beyond even the continental shelf. Usually we're talking at least 200 and 300 miles offshore and in very, very deep waters. Uh, the, uh, uh, for example, the, the uh, richest areas that we know of are about five to 6,000 meters deep in the clarion Clipperton zone in the central Pacific Ocean between Hawaii and, uh, and Mexico. Uh, so really very, very deep. And that would basically essentially cover the tallest building, buildings on the planet. Oh, sure. By a lot. By a lot. And the tallest mountains on the planet. By a lot. Yes. Very, very deep. And uh, we did have some idea as to what was there, even back in the 70s. Um, uh, the particular uh, resource that we're most interested in is something called manganese nodules, which uh, are basically mineral-rich rocks which have uh, accumulated on the seabed over millions of years. They're actually found throughout the world's oceans. Uh, in some areas, they're much richer than others. Uh, and they were actually discovered as long ago as 1865 by the Challenger expedition, which was uh, a British expedition that circumnavigated the globe. Uh, so we've known about their existence for a long time. Uh, and we knew even back in the 1970s that uh, parts of the Pacific Ocean contained very, very rich uh, resources of these minerals. Uh, but of course, since then, uh, there's been more than 40 years, almost 50 years, in fact, of uh, dedicated exploration, uh, studying these resources, studying the geology, how they form, studying what they're made of, uh, how useful they could be, and, of course, uh, studying the environment in which they're found and uh, the sort of uh, uh, environmental conditions that exist in the deepest parts of the ocean. And I imagine also how they are actually part of that ecosystem as well. I mean, it's extracting them could create potentially some disruptions to ecosystems in the deep sea. Indeed, that's, uh, that's, that's possible, uh, and uh, that's been a great part of the authorities' work uh, over the past 25 years. Um, the way we work is that uh, we allocate contracts to countries that are interested in exploring for these resources. We give 15-year exploration contracts, and we expect the contractor during that time to carry out uh, research cruises, to uh, study the resources, to study the environment, uh, to understand them better. Uh, but most importantly, to report back to us all the information that they learn, all, especially all the environmental information that they learn. Uh, and again, I go back to the concept that uh, uh, governs us, which is this concept of uh, benefit to humanity, because we in the ISA keep these data and we make them available uh, through a data portal to anybody who wants to access them in the world, uh, whether they're uh, rich countries, poor countries, uh, scientists, uh, educators, whatever, so that uh, these, these data that have cost millions of dollars and many years to collect are really making a tremendous contribution to marine science. So these contracts, are they for specifically for scientific research or are they for identifying what might be for a, a company, uh, and not that that's a bad word, but for industry, to understand whether there are th minerals and other resource materials at the deep sea or the deep seabed level. But in that process, they are also, they are also conducting scientific research. Correct. I mean, you summed it up very well. Of course, the contract is an exploration contract, so it's with a view to determining whether the resource is worth exploiting in the future, whether there is a commercial uh, uh, benefit to that resource. Uh, but it, it, ISA requires that at the same time research is carried out, and particularly environmental research, because before anybody could 
possibly move to the exploitation phase, to the, the phase of recovering the minerals, we'd require them to carry out an environmental impact assessment and to demonstrate that uh, they would be able to do that without uh, adversely impacting the environment. So, so we, we require uh, a tremendous amount of uh, marine science to be carried out. Since the 1970s and the creation of the, of the Seabed Authority, um, how many of these contracts have been, have been issued? So at the moment, uh, we have just issued the 30th exploration contract. Uh, we have, I think, 22 different countries involved, um, working in the Pacific, Atlantic, and Indian Oceans. I think the total area of exploration is about uh, just over a million square kilometers, which sounds like an awful lot. Um, I'm sure people will be uh, quite uh, shocked by that number. But in fact, if you look at the size of the ocean, that's uh, less than... 1% of the ocean floor. So The ocean floor, when we speak about the 54%, correct. that is under the authority's right. supervision in this regard. That's right. To what extent uh, do you have the authority to hold people accountable to the contracts for which they have been granted mm -hmm. this, this opportunity? Because it is a huge opportunity. It is, as you stated, from the very, very top, for the benefit of all humankind. And yet we are seeing this within a context of business taking the initiative, and business has its own imperatives. Well, when we say the authority, the ISA, it doesn't mean me, first of all. <laughs> it doesn't mean no, my no, secretariat. Course, but, but you... we're, in a, we're an organization with 168 member states. Similar to UNESCO. Similar to UNESCO, uh, including uh, the European Union and all its member states, uh, all the major maritime powers, and um, all decisions in the ISA, including decisions as to awarding contracts, are given by consensus. So the contractors are operating with the consensus of the member states of ISA, and they are accountable to the member states of ISA. And there's one other aspect of the regime that is also uh, unique and really super important, which is that every contract has to be sponsored by a member state. So that member state has a direct link to the contractor and is can be held accountable for the actions of its sponsored contractor uh, and has to show up to the ISA Council or the ISA Assembly and... Uh, has to uh, demonstrate that that contract is being fulfilled in, in good faith. So really there's a, there's a lot of checks and balances throughout the system. I'm speaking with Michael Lodge, who is the Secretary General of the International Seabed Authority. And we're talking about what is happening in the deep sea, uh, what is happening in terms of the natural resources there, what we know, what we don't know, what do we know? Michael, what don't we know? Well, what we know is that the ocean uh, is host to endless supplies of minerals. Um, for example, again, the clarion Clipperton zone uh, that I mentioned earlier has more cobalt, nickel, uh, copper, and manganese in the nodules of the clarion Clipperton zone than all the resources that we know about on land. And, and, and where's that zone again? That's between Hawaii and Mexico. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it's quite a large area, um, but uh, it's about 6 million square kilometers uh, in, in total in that area, uh, but uh, tremendously rich in, in mineral resources. Uh, and uh, these minerals are attracting more and more attention these days because... Cobalt, nickel in particular, these are the metals that we need in vast quantities in order to make the transition to a low-carbon society. Uh, these are going to replace fossil fuels. Uh, these, these will make the batteries for your electric cars and buses and, uh, uh, and everything else. Uh, and one of the key advantages of polymetallic nodules is exactly as the name suggests, they are polymetallic. So within one rock, you have four metals. You have cobalt, copper, nickel, and manganese. You also have small amounts of rare earth elements, which are 
also quite interesting. But uh, in in many ways, this is this is a battery in a rock, and uh, it's uh, looking very attractive for uh, a number of investors uh, now. Uh, so that's on the geology side, on the on the minerals side. Of course, we're also learning through this process an enormous amount about the marine environment. Thanks to the work that uh, ISA has done through its contractors, even in the last 10 years, hundreds of new species have been discovered and described that are new to science. So all the time we're learning more and more about the marine environment. And, and as I said, we're making this information available to everybody. Uh, we're also working very closely with uh, IOC UNESCO, for example, uh, particularly in the context of the uh, decade, the upcoming UN decade for ocean science. Uh, so, you know, you started at the top of the program with uh, saying we know more about the surface of the moon than we do about the ocean, but uh, that's a very superficial statement. In some aspects, we actually do know quite a lot about the ocean, and we're learning more all the time. Marine life, new species, species that exist within these ecosystems that have essentially remained untouched since the beginning of time. We know how extraction works on, on the Earth's surface. We know even how extraction works in terms of offshore drilling. Uh, we know that there can be consequences. Um, and those consequences can, can, can deeply and vastly disrupt these ecosystems. How are you, and again, when I use that, I'm talking about more the global, the global you, the ISA, the International Seabed Authority. How are you striking the balance between what we say we need in terms of these mineral resources and other things that maybe even have yet to be discovered. Um, and what are the ecosystems and the marine life that have existed there? Yeah, I mean, you know, mining is always an emotive word, whether it's on land or, or at sea, because as soon as people talk about mining, they start to think about uh, uh, environmental consequences. Uh, and certainly when you talk about uh, mining on land, you immediately think of deforestation, uh, diverting rivers, uh, disrupting people, child labor even in the case of uh, some countries and pollution. some resources, pollution. Uh, and uh, of course, this is, this is a concern. Um, in terms of the uh, deep sea mining, I, again, one thing to note is that it hasn't started yet. And that is largely because of the existence of the International Seabed Authority that has regulated this activity in a very, very precautionary and very cautious way so that uh, uh, nobody has been permitted to proceed to that stage of exploitation because we're still gathering the data and studying the environment and learning more about the consequences. Uh, for example, one of the... Uh, one of the things that people uh, will be required to do as part of uh, their exploration is to test uh, their uh, equipment that they propose to use, and then we'll, we'll learn what are the consequences of using this particular type of equipment. Is it uh, what environmental damage is caused? And then we'll be able to figure out what are the measures that we need to take in terms of uh, minimizing damage uh, in terms of, uh, you know, only mining certain parts of the seafloor and not touching other parts. Um, and I can give you an example. Uh, you know, one of the things we've done, again, in the clarion Clipperton zone is that uh, even before mining has taken place, we have already uh, set aside 1.6 million square kilometres uh, as protected areas. Um, which is actually one of the largest protected areas on the planet. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's a huge area where, where no mining is do going to take place, and those areas can act as repositories for the biodiversity in that area that, uh, that we need to protect. 
So, uh, you know, it's the key word for ISA is that we are taking a very, very careful and precautionary approach to this. And unlike any other ocean industry, whether it's offshore drilling, fishing, what have you, we are regulating before the industry has started. So we, we have a really unique opportunity to get this right first time. You know, ocean drilling started by accident. People going offshore the coast of California first 50 meters, then 100 meters, and further and further before people started to think about how you regulate this. But we are, we are putting in place regulation before things start, and that's, that's almost unprecedented, I think. I guess the last thing you would like, to, or not like, the last thing you would want to see happen would be a kind of deep horizon moment in the deep sea. Uh, absolutely. Nobody wants to see that. Uh, there, is a, there is a bit of a difference between oil and nodules. Uh, uh, you know, we're dealing with hard minerals. Uh, they're rocks. They're not a volatile compound like oil. So uh, there is an important difference between oil and gas and, and the sort of hard minerals that we're dealing with. And yet from what I think I've understood from what you're telling me is that we are, we are still understanding what is the what is the ecosystem that exists how these minerals these hard rocks are essentially um, interacting with that ecosystem at highly pressurized um, deep sea uh, levels um, where we might not have that understanding on terra firma yeah we're still learning of course and and you know even in the last 5 years the science has uh, has advanced tremendously and you know we have now these 30 contracts as i mentioned each of these contracting countries is spending millions of dollars every year on marine science to help us to understand better so i think we're in a pretty good state as far as getting sufficient understanding of the environment and the ecosystem to cautiously advance on a step-by-step -step basis and nobody is talking about going wholesale and just saying opening up the seafloor and saying go for it we're, we're dealing with this in a very very precautionary way of the 30 con of these 30 contracts uh, they were, began to be issued when within the the last 10 years within the last five within the last 20 well, as I said, this activity started way back in the 1970s. Mm -hmm. uh, so some of the very early contracts were grandfathered in when the law of the sea mm -hmm. came into effect, and they've continued ever since. So in some of the, the longest-running contracts, we have something like 40 years of accumulated research. But no extraction. Uh, no extraction. No mm -hmm. extraction has taken place yet. Uh, there have been tests, uh, and actually it was... Uh, the, uh, the U.S. Uh, was active back in the 1970s and uh, demonstrated successfully that nodules could be recovered from those depths. So technologically, it was possible even back in the 1970s. It wasn't economic in the 1970s, and we did not know enough about the environment to allow it to happen in the 1970s, but we knew that it was feasible. And uh, what has happened since then is that... Uh, the technology has advanced tremendously. We have the benefit of uh, fantastic uh, new technology like AUVs that are incredibly sophisticated, uh, video cameras that can take perfect uh, pictures at uh, 6,000 meters water depth, amazing new technology that uh, really helps us a lot to understand the technology. Um, and... Uh, the contracts have been added to gradually since then, but uh, I would say there's been an increase in interest over the past five years, which is, I think, entirely driven by the demand for new sources of minerals. You're listening to Many Voices, One World. I'm George Papianis, your host, and my guest is Michael Lodge, who is the Secretary General of the International Seabed Authority. In our previous segment, you mentioned that millions of dollars have been spent in terms of this research. It's millions of dollars, of course, being spent with the expectation that that money will, over time, be recovered by the capacity of these companies uh, to be successfully then get into the process of extraction and monetize those resources for sale on the market. Um, 
How do we create that balance in terms of the way industry will operate eventually? I mean, I'm assuming that we do see that we are moving toward extraction um, against this benefit to humanity by maintaining, of course, that we are going to protect those those areas that are being mined. Yeah, well, you're right. We're moving slowly towards exploitation. Uh, I, I sometimes see it in the media described as a gold rush, but I would say that it's the slowest gold rush in history, if that's the case. <laughs> um, and uh, as, as you said, George... Um, Exploration is just a, a question of spending a lot of money and uh, getting no return. So eventually, uh, yes, uh, the, the uh, contractors hope, first of all, that they will find a commercially viable mineral resource because they may be looking in the wrong place. There's no guarantees here. Uh, but then we'll begin to exploit it. And uh, a, couple of, a couple of interesting things happen when you start to uh, recover the resource uh, first, obviously, the contractor will uh, will will start to recover their investment. But uh, we also require, and again, this is one of the very unique features of this legal regime. Uh, they have to pay royalties to ISA, uh, and quite substantial royalties, um, and those royalties are to be distributed by ISA for the benefit of all humanity. Uh, with a particular benefit, particular emphasis on the developing countries. Uh, so this is a question of equity. Uh, what we're saying in effect, or what the convention is saying, is that uh, these resources uh, are the common heritage of mankind. They belong to everybody. And so therefore, part of the value of those resources has to be come back to humanity in the form of, uh, of, of royalties on the minerals that are produced. Um, and uh, that's just the financial part of it, the, the economic part. But uh, of, of course, there are uh, intangible benefits as well, which include the increased scientific knowledge that I mentioned, the fact that scientific data is, is available through ISA for, for everybody, uh, as well as the fact that there's a bigger supply and better supply of uh, very, very critical minerals for everybody on the planet. Are those royalties going to be a check to a national treasury or uh, with, with essentially just deposit that and do as you please? Or is it going to be uh, have, have the member states of the ISI decided that that these will be royalties for certain activities, for example, potentially for for working against or uh, mitigating the environmental damage that we've done on the surface and that we are contending with now? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. And uh, that's something that is still up for debate, in fact, because the royalties haven't started to come in yet. Uh, and I think there's a number of different views. I mean, yes, I think some people will probably argue it should be in the form of a check. Uh, others would argue that this is a global public good, so there's uh, more interest in things that you could do with this money. Climate change adaptation, for example, uh, more scientific research, uh, a lot of different uh, public projects uh, to support developing countries. Uh, there's a lot of interesting things that could be done, and that's actually a very live and active discussion that's taking place within ISA at the moment. Where would you like to see it go? Well, it's not for me to decide. It's really, uh, it's a very uh, exhaustive process that we have of uh, working through our different committees and councils. And, uh, you know, this is a decision in the end, it will be for member states. But uh, I think there's, there's an awareness amongst member states that this is, this is a benefit to humanity. And it's something that uh, everybody on the planet should benefit from and, uh, and not be uh, not be used in a idle fashion. You know, we just recently saw the uh, conclusion of uh, COP25 in Madrid, and it does seem, at least from the news reports that I've been re reading, uh, that we've missed the mark. Um, and this is this is essentially a meeting, a conference of parties representing the interests of member states, and so 
in that context of what we just saw happen not so long ago in Madrid, and as you're preparing for what could be a new future uh, in terms of exploration, exploitation, I'll use exploitation, but within the best sense of the word, um, how do we change what is the profile that at least we see today? Yeah, I mean, that's a very good question. And, uh, you know, I don't uh, participate in, in uh, COP, but of course I've seen the reports and uh, seen the outcomes. Uh, you know, I tend to take a more optimistic view. Um, and particularly in the case of the ISA, I think one of the things that is really to the credit of ISA is that even in this very, very difficult uh, area where there's many, many different positions, many different national interests, many different concerns. Uh, I say as operator for 25 years by consensus. Uh, we've never had a vote <laughs> and uh, uh, on, on any critical issue like this. And so, uh, you know, I, I have a lot of faith in the the system that has been very, very carefully designed by the Law of the Sea Convention to ensure that all interests are represented and that there's ample opportunity for all concerns to be aired and discussed and to eventually reach a consensus. Uh, you know, the law of the sea itself took uh, more than nine years to negotiate. It took 30 years to negotiate if you, if you go back to when it all started in the 1960s, but the law of the sea conference itself was, was nine years. So they did a very good job. They, they created this constitution for the oceans, which has done its job very, very effectively and promoted consensus on issues that really are very, very difficult. What's the role that you see for the deep ocean uh, playing in the next 10 years? I use the 10-year mark because I'm thinking about the ocean decade. Well, I think uh, deep sea science over the next 10 years will, will increase and uh, uh, there will be continued interest uh, and and uh, continued uh, refinement of exploration. I think I think what will also happen is that deep sea research will move away from a pure academic focus to becoming much more applied and looking at the problems that we really really need to solve uh, in, if we're going to make sustainable use of uh, deep sea resources. Uh, you know, it's no, uh, I think you can spend hundreds of millions of dollars on taking a very broad approach and trying to study everything, but uh, that's not very really pragmatic. What you have to do is to identify what are the, what are the really critical scientific questions that need to be answered and then focus the research to answer those questions, which will then give us a, a new... Uh, baseline to proceed from. You think there should be a moratorium during the decade on uh, deep sea mining as it, in its extractive form? Well, I, I I heard talk of a moratorium, but I'm really not sure what that means because uh, effectively deep sea mining is not permitted now because uh, we have not issued any. Uh, permissions for anybody to carry out extraction and we won't do that unless the proponent can satisfy the authority the 168 member states that it can be done in a way that is environmentally responsible uh, so a moratorium really would not serve any practical purpose uh, in fact it would probably have a totally counterproductive purpose because it would uh, disincentivize anybody from spending a hundred million dollars to carry out a research cruise uh, or a, a, a campaign of uh, of cruisers. Why would anyone put their money into deep sea science if there's nothing in it for them? So uh, I, I think this would be uh, the wrong way to go. It uh, would not would not improve the science. Uh, in fact, it might uh, have the opposite effect. And uh, we have the mechanisms in place as it is to ensure that. Uh, exploitation does not take place unless it is under the stringent conditions that are established by the ISA. The deep ocean, do you see it as the last frontier of ocean science for sustainable development? 
Well, it's certainly a frontier. Who knows if it's the last frontier, but it's uh, it's certainly a frontier. And there's much, much more to discover. That's true. It's not a it's not a simple place. Uh, you know, we've talked in the last half an hour about uh, mainly about nodules in the clarion clipperton zone. We haven't even got on to, dis to discuss other types of resources uh, that you find on the mid-ocean ridges, for example, which is a completely different environmental and geological setting. Cobalt-rich crusts, which is another entirely different geological and, and environmental setting. So there's plenty more to discover, but... Uh, uh, we we have a very focused approach, and uh, in some areas we have a lot of knowledge. In other areas, we don't have so much knowledge, and so we need to continue working on that. More to discover and more to discuss. Let's say that's an open invitation to come back. Thank you very much. I would love to. My guest has been Michael Lodge, and he is the Secretary General of the International Seabed Authority. Michael, it's been a pleasure having you with us. Thank you very much, George. It's a pleasure, too. You've been listening to Many Voices, One World, and I'm your host, George Pompeianus. I wish you a great day, wherever you may be.